The ones they've always said believer must understand that God did not make the new covenant easier. He made it harder. The reason he made it harder is because he gave us all the Holy Spirit. We need to obey him. Matthew 5, 27, you have heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, basically this would say, but I tell you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's how the KJV would read. Um, the old covenant condemned physical adultery. So Jesus is taking it a step further here. And he says, nope, even if you look with lust, it's equivalent to doing the act itself. The same is applicable for divorce and marriage. Now, forgive me because I don't know what translation this is, but I can definitely tell because I am team K KJV. This is not KJV. So I messed up on this when I was um, copying and pasting this, but just bear with me. Matthew 5, 31 through 32, it says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate or writing of divorcement. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual morality, KJV says fornication, makes her the victim of adultery, committeth adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman committeth adultery. You have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. So grace is not a license for immorality in times of ignorance. God winked at sin. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. The now is during the time of grace. He's no longer winking at sin. And again, grace teaches believers to live holy and righteously today, according to Titus 2, 11 through 12. We see rebukes from the Apostle Paul, John, Peter about these false teachers who pervert the, the grace of God, but none as strong as the half brother of Jesus, Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, okay, I'm back in KJV now, I can tell. <laughs> Uh, write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye shall earnestly contend for the faith, which is what I'm doing, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Jude 1, 3 through 5. So the early church, like us today, was constantly fighting off these, these false doctrines, these false teachers. Jude says these men crept in. So they would have named the name of Christ. They would have had some doctrinal truths. They, they would have prophesied, perhaps cast out demons. They would have looked extremely similar to a true Christian as with the wheat and tares. But ultimately, they had another gospel where repentance from sin and obedience is optional and not required for salvation. So their conduct is the same as it was before they ever professed Christ. The fruit is a testament that they were pretenders. So Jude says they deny the Lord Jesus with their lifestyles and because they have accepted another gospel. Jude goes on to remind us that the Lord, after delivering his people, the apple of his eye from Egypt later destroyed them because of unbelief. It's not that they had intellectual unbelief. They witnessed the, the templates of Egypt come upon Egypt while they were untouched. They witnessed the Red Sea part and crossed on dry land. So they knew this God was mighty and mighty to deliver. They just didn't continue in obedience, which means they didn't believe God or Moses who gave them the words of Hashem. The one who believes God obeys God. Now I want to talk about transfer righteousness, question mark. <laughs> For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 20, who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
Again, going back to what the Apostle John said, little children, let no one deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. First John 2, 29. If ye know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteous is born of him. When a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, I lay a stumbling and I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sins and his righteousness, which he have done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Ezekiel three eighteen, Matthew five ten says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sakes for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. First Peter three twelve. for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil so this is the issue that we have is that they believe that our that jesus christ's righteousness is transferred to us um and they get that from the word propitiation the issue with that is that the greek word for propitiation does not mean transfer so it does not mean that jesus transferred his righteousness onto those who believe because again, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the pharisees you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven shout out from Jesus. Remember the Pharisees, they had the, they had the profession. They had the appearance of godliness. They just did not have the fruit nor a single drop of faith leading to salvation because they remained unconverted said, but did not do. So the propitiation in the Greek means an offering to appease an offended party. Jesus Christ is the only acceptable sacrifice to pacify the wrath of a thrice holy and just God. God does not violate his own justice, which means he does not overlook sin and he will not lower his standards for sinners. He still requires perfection. So only a blameless, sinless sacrifice can be perfectly obedient to all God's laws and make atonement for those who broke all of God's laws. He is the propitiation, the offering to the creator that we've offended. Our faith and obedience to his gospel are accredited to us for righteousness, meaning God no longer holds the crimes we've committed against us. They have been expunged. So as long as we abide in Christ, the Lord reveals to Ezekiel, that the one who turns from righteousness has their has their charges reinstated. None of their righteousness is even remembered by the Lord. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So clearly Jesus Christ and his righteousness are not transferred to the believer. Otherwise, such an exhortation would not be in your Bible. If his righteousness were transferred unto us, we'd have no need to put on the whole armor of God to fight sin and the devil. We'd have no need to cut off our hand or pluck out the eye. Of course, Jesus is not endorsing mutilation here. He's simply saying, take drastic measures to get the sin out of your life. Just don't go to hell. If you're struggling with pornography, Cut the internet, get rid of the phone, throw out the laptop. Just don't descend into the pit. Plucking out the eye is clearing out your internet history and making a covenant with your eyes to not look upon evil as with Job. Whatever you do, don't be cast into hell. Just as sin is not transferable from person to person, neither is righteousness. Ezekiel 18, 20 through 22 says, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So this is a passage that I like to use whenever I am, whenever I'm contending with Catholics who believe in original sin, your own righteousness will be upon you. Likewise, your own wickedness will be upon you. There is no shared righteousness. Obedience is righteousness. God says the one who turns from disobedience to obedience will surely live and all of his transgressions will be blotted out. This is not a new God. The Lord used the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, to advise mankind that he has not changed his stance on the issue of sin and salvation. He waited just before we crossed over into the new covenant to put mankind on notice. Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. The Apostle Paul said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So we can only conclude that God hated sin in the beginning 
And because he does not change, he still hates sin today. And because he does not change, he's going to hate sin as long as he's God. God hated sin so much that he prepared an eternal place of torment that he will cast all sinners, Christ rejectors all into forever. And so we've perverted God's love to have people believe that God loves everyone the way that they are. When the Bible says God hates all workers of iniquity. Most people don't know that God. I didn't know that God. I did not know him. God has a benevolent love for all mankind. He demonstrated that love at the cross and every day that he endures sinners. But God does not love us in our iniquities. There is no such scripture as God loves the sinner and hates to sin. God is not casting sin into hell. He's casting sinners into hell. So we need to take the word of God seriously. And if you're not in his word, you are a target to be deceived by the devil, believing every wind and wave of doctrine and betting your whole eternity that your pastor got it right. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. That tells me that I can't put my trust in anybody else. I got to get directly to the source right up in the word of God. I can't be lazy. I can't shove this off like it's no big deal. I'm just going to believe what everyone says. The scripture is the standard of truth. The scripture is the word of God. Scripture alone. As you all hear me often say in my street evangelism, once you step into eternity, you're not coming out. So you need to spend time in God's word to make sure you go into eternity with a biblical doctrine and not one that will actually damn you at the end of the beginning of your eternity. Satan can only deceive those who have not been shut up with God and his word. Sanctification is not sinless. Obedience and faithfulness to Jesus unto the end is the key to the kingdom. So an examination of the, of the few scriptures that we examine today, once saved, always saved is proven to be a lie. And the only acceptable acronym for OSAS is once saved, always sanctifying. Anything else is heresy. I really hope and pray that you all take all of this to the Lord in prayer. I hope that you are compelled to seek the Lord while he may be found, that you take the time to study the scriptures for yourself, challenge everything that you heard here today. Don't just take someone's word for it. That's like the the one thing that I can that I can share with the sheep that God has entrusted to me here in this small ministry. And this ministry is small um, because I, I refuse to move from what is written. And guys, don't, don't think that, that this, the enemy has not sent these people here to try to get me off of scripture. We have to be unmovable on God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would open up blinded eyes that you would unplug deaf ears lord open our hearts to receive and understand what your spirit is saying in this hour lord that you are requiring holiness you said in your word that without holiness no man shall see your face lord and i'm just asking lord that you would just send your holy spirit to convict of sin lord and you promised that for us that when the holy spirit comes he will convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment as i've done everything that you have asked me to do that you would now do the rest of the work, Lord. You will give the increase. And I just pray that someone will be saved from this, that someone will turn from deceit to truth. And I pray that, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over this message. We plead the blood of Jesus over every listener, Lord. We pray for, for those who have been deceived by this doctrine. And we also pray, Lord, for those who have taught it and they've done so knowingly, rather they've done it knowingly or unknowingly, Lord. We just pray for your mercy and grace. We just pray, Lord, that you would continue to send your Holy Spirit and convict our hearts to truth. And we just pray, Lord, for the loss. We see the signs of the time, Lord, that time is winding up. Lord, we just pray that you would raise up even more laborers, Lord, to go forth and, and preach the gospel that many people can be saved and get on the ark before the time of the end. And so, Lord, I ask that you bless this message and bless those who hear it, Lord. They may not turn today, but we just pray that you continue to prick their hearts and convict their hearts for those who are struggling to receive this message, to receive the truth of your word. Lord, we just pray that you would unhearten their heart and give them a heart to receive what your spirit is saying. All these blessings and prayers we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.